All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Build Like a Startup Founder, a forum for student leaders. We hope you guys are excited as much as we are for today's event. Of course, before we you know get into the meat and the main uh, topic for today's event, let us you know not forget to offer it up to God. So to lead us in prayer, take it away, Leon. Let us remember we are always in the holy presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts, thanking you for gathering us all here together in this moment to grow in unity through our thirst for knowledge and growth. We are truly grateful for you, for all the success of the preparation leading up to this moment, where your guidance was evident in every detail. Lord, bless each and every person present here in this meeting and open their hearts to receive your wisdom through the words that will be uttered today through our speaker, Mr. Gonzalez. All of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, our hope, handmaid of the Lord, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, good morning, everyone. We are Kobe Camaso and Leon Alcazarin, the President and Vice President of the Paris Northfield Student Council. And we welcome you all once again to build like a startup founder, a forum for student leaders. Now, we know you guys are very excited, but before we you know, turn you over to today's speaker, we would like to see first how far this event has reached. That's right, Kobe. I want to know, please comment down below in our chat box where you're logging in from. Let's see where all of you guys are coming from here. Yes, that's right. Now, while they are commenting, we would also like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Jaya Ong, the OSA Director of the University of Santo Tomas. Thank you so, so much for joining us here today. Now, before we go through the, the chat box here, I'd like to ask you first, Leon, and of course, this question also extends to all of our participants here today. So, Leon, what are your expectations for today's event? Um, you know, honestly, Kobe, this learning about this thing was like a jump scare to me. It's just like I opened my phone and it's like, oh, we're doing this now. So I, I have really high expectations, uh, but no pressure. But I, I do have high expectations. I'm really excited to see what Sir Gonzalez has to say um, later. What about you, Kobe? Honestly, Honestly, I feel the same. I'm very, very excited to learn a lot here today. And hopefully, we will be able to apply the things that we learned here to our own student councils. Now, let's check our chat box to see where the people are logging in from. So, we have people from Cebu, from Antipolo, from Cavite. Leon, check out these. Check out our comments here. Uh, all the way to Cebu. Yeah. Hello, hello. Whoa. And of course, really? our question extends to all of you guys. I also want to know how you guys are feeling about the event today, what you're expecting, you know, what you want to happen. Yes, we are. I'm sure we are all very, very excited. So uh, if you guys have any questions later that you would have for our speaker, you may ask them here in our chat box or you may raise your hand if you would like to say your question to Martin. So I, I think with that, we're, we're quite settled in. And Leon, would you like to do the honors? I, no, no. One, one more. I'd also like to know how far we've reached in terms of schools. I want to know, everyone, what school are we coming from today? What are we, what, where are we from? I'm obviously, we're from Northfield, but I'm also really curious about the demographics of where you guys uh, go to school. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping that our you know, fellow Northfield students are also here today. Oh, I'm seeing our fellow Paris students and also students from UST. Uh, where else? From St. Mary's College of Make Hawaiian. More from Paris Southridge. Oh, from the Montessori Integrated School. Wow. We sure do have a lot of students from uh, a varying number of schools here. Do you see That's any nice. more schools here, Leon? Uh, no, we missed Kobe, some of them. you're good at reading, man. <laughs> yeah. 
There's just so many schools. Okay, I think we can. I I think we can now introduce our speaker. You know, so that uh he has more time to be able to share his experiences and his knowledge with us. So Leon, take it away. Yeah, let's not drag it any further. So I, of course, I'm very excited to introduce you all to our speaker, who, aside from being the co-author of the Bonfire Movement, uh, moment book itself. He's also one of our very own from the Paris system. Who's this guy? That's right, Leon. He graduated from our brother's school, Paris Southridge, and went on to study at Columbia University in, in New York and the London School of Economics. So I'd like you all to give a virtual round of applause to Mr. Martin Gonzalez. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Uh, and thanks, Leon and Koi, for hosting us here. You both are such naturals. All right. So All right. before we, sorry, before we get into uh, your talk today, we would just like to ask you how you are, how you're doing, where you're tuning in from. We're coming in from the so U.S. No, this is the tail end of a Wednesday. I am in um, Silicon Valley. I'm based in a city called Redwood Shores. Um, as, as you probably all know from the intro, I, I work at the headquarters of Google, um, and I, I've spent about 10 years now so far in my career with Google. Uh, so that's where I'm dialing in from. Sir, what, what kind of expectations do you have going in, uh, to the event from us this time, from us student leaders? Well, you know, so as I was preparing for this conversation, it was so fun for me to think back on a lot of my core memories uh, from when I was in high school and college. Um, so I am excited to share some stories, some lessons um, from that time in my life. It took a while. It, I, it's been maybe 20 years since I was your age, um, but I'm excited to hear your questions and you know have a nice conversation here. This is your time. So I'll, you know, I won't, I won't, I'll spend maybe 15, 20 minutes telling a few stories and, you know, you ask your questions and we can have a nice conversation here. All right, Leon, that's um, the not other, The other expectation, actually, Kobe, if I can ask, for those who are, and there's no pressure whatsoever, but if you are compelled to switch on your video, it just makes this feel a lot more like a, like a conversation in a cafe somewhere and, you know, we can, uh, we can have a more intimate conversation. So, but only if you can, I know sometimes bandwidth is, is difficult. Yes, that's right, guys. Hopefully, you do can. We do highly encourage you to turn on your cameras. All right, let's not hold Sir Martin any further, Leon. So take it away, sir. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, one thing I'm so aware of is some of the heroes in my in my early life, like Manrentoy and uh, Ruch Rahensha, are both here, and so. What a great honor to um to address you all with um uh with some of these uh mentors of mine. As I was preparing for this chat, I was asked to talk about some of the leadership lessons that might be useful for you. As I understand it, many of you are starting to prepare for the new school year, and you will be um you know you will be at some point you know leading whether it's as a representative of your class um, or of your you know of your high school. Um, so I wanted to to reflect on three stories I wanted to share and and therefore three lessons um, from my early years that were really the beginnings of me learning how to be a leader. Um, a lot of these lessons I have found um, have lasted, you know, through the years. Um, today, I spend a lot of time um, advising leaders from really around the world. Um, a big part of my work is to sit very closely with our senior leaders at Google um, and help them think through a lot of the, pe the people challenges that they face. Um, a, big, a big part of what, um, so, so Kobe and Leon mentioned it, I wrote a, uh, published a book recently and um, an anchor point of that book, the reason why that book actually came to be was there was a, a study from Harvard and McKinsey um, that looked at startups. Startups are, you know, tech companies that are usually, uh, you know, five people with, you know, who are usually under, you know, people who are in college who decide to to build a company together. Um, and 
And this book was written for founders of these kinds of um, small companies, these startups. And these researchers from Harvard and, and McKinsey, which is a consulting firm, asked the question, what was the number one reason for failure of these companies? We know that many startups fail. What was the number one reason for it? And they found in this classic study that 65% of startups failed because of people issues. And a lot of that was a lack of leadership, um, unable to you know, resolve conflicts within the group. You know, I find that even if that's, that statistic comes from the startup world, I have found that in all my work in you know, being in, in, um, in clubs uh, uh, in high school and in college, um, it, it, was the same, it was the same story. So I would, I would venture a guess that in your own experience as you go about this work of leading your, your groups, your organizations, um, think about how the people factor, the, 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 your ability to lead a bunch of people. Um, think about that and make sure you're not just thinking about the projects you're running, but think about the how you're going about the work. So it's not just about what you do, but but how you do it. So here are three stories, um, and therefore three lessons as you know that I picked up as I was going about you know my high school and and, and college years. The first one is a story about the alternative prom, and the alternative prom was an idea that um, a few friends of mine and myself cooked up. Um, when I when we were incoming juniors, um, um, the idea worked this way. We thought that going to a traditional prom where you would you know buy a suit, rent out a hotel ballroom, and spend really thousands of of, of pesos felt very ostentatious and felt like it was not worth spending the money. Now, look, if you want to do this, I have no judgment, but during that time. We were so convicted that we would much rather take that money and take our dates, still have, you know, still invite our, you know, a, a, a date over and uh, bring bring them to an orphanage. Uh, in this case, it was chosen children in Tagaytay. Um, and and do us, you know, have spend a simple afternoon with them, uh, take care of, of the kids. Many of them had special needs. And then, you know, do a simple party, but really all the fun that would have gone to this really lavish event in a hotel room, um, in a hotel, hotel ballroom, we would then kind of donate it to the, to the orphanage, the chosen children. Well, the idea seemed really um, idealistic and it was really, uh, you know, we thought, why wouldn't anyone want to come along with this idea? It was idealistic. It, it felt like it was doing the right thing. It was in service of others. Well, we, when we started on this journey of trying to do this project, we did not realize just how much pressure and pushback and objections we would get, not just from our classmates, but from their parents. And then in, in a sense, from the, from the administration of Southridge. I remember in um, one of the most difficult moments of that project, I, we were called into the principal's office, the executive director's office, rather. Um, and in that office, a parent, not my parents, and my parents weren't there, but another, you know, another person's parents, the parents who were organizing the traditional prom. Um, basically, we had a pretty co confrontational conversation around why we wanted to do this. And you know what I discovered in that moment? I discovered that when I was growing up, I was a very shy kid and I was very reserved. I was very self-conscious. I would not really speak my mind if I wasn't really asked to or pushed to. But in this moment, I was so ready to, to talk about why we thought this was a good idea and why we would push through anyway, even if it was just three of us and we, the core team was three, um, if, if just the three of us were, were going to be there. And I discovered an interesting lesson in that moment I realized, first of all, that age differences between you and management really ultimately will not matter at some point in the future. Usually, by the time you graduate college, you will discover that a lot of the work you will do will be with people who are 10 years older than you, 20 years older, and that this is the case in the, in the work that I, I've done since graduating college. And the second thing I realized was when I was advocating, when I was telling people what I wanted, what I what were my preferences, my, my needs and wants, um, I would feel very uh, shy about that. But when I was advocating for an idea, 
that I really believed in or for or for a group of people that I wanted to take care of or support or serve, I realized that all that shyness, all that lack of, you know, of, of, um, of willpower, all those go away. So the question for you with this first story is, you know, what are your convictions? And as you go about this work in leading these organizations, what do you want, like, what problems do you want to solve? And what, what changes do you want to create? Um, and then who do you want to do that for? Because if you can be clear about the ideas you care deeply about and the people you want to serve, then you will overcome all the obstacles and all the shyness uh, that perhaps you might be bringing um, to the work. Um, the conclusion of this story was we ended up pushing through with the alternative prom. I think of, of our, at that time, I think we were 60 in our batch. You know, I think we were only about 20 who attended and we were completely happy with 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 the turnout. Um, but it was such a revolutionary idea at the time that um, I remember I remember we received letters from Cardinal Sin, who was still around at the time, from Pope John Paul at the time, which was crazy, from the mayor, from I think the pre I think Arab, who was the president then, also wrote us. Uh, but for me, the thing that I still up to this day tell people about um, when they ask for like, what is trivia about you that no one knows? Um, Archie Comics, if, you, if you're familiar with them, they were very popular in the 90s. Um, Archie Comics um, caught wind of the story and actually drew us into an, into a, um, into an, um, an issue where Archie and Reggie, who are the, who are the main characters of this, uh, of this um, comics, uh, meet, meet Juan Miguel Montes, Leon Pexon, and Martin Gonzalez in, in Southridge, um, in the Philippines, they fly over to attend uh, an alternative prom. So anyway, so all that to say, like when you are clear about your convictions and clear about who you want to serve, I think a lot of the shyness and a lot of the hesitation um, goes away. So that's the first story. Um, the second story was um, has to do with maybe the one organization that I was involved with the longest from high school and into college. And this was a faith-based group called the Youth Apostolate um, in our in our parish church in in um, in Alabang called uh, Saint James. Um, at some point, I was um, I was going to. At some point, I was a, a a member of this of this group and then became a leader of the group, and I felt like it was my job to really understand who were the people in the organization, and. What are their superpowers and how do I get them to be involved in, in the work? Well, I discovered this, this group of students who were in, um, in this apostolate who, who really love to do, um, they love to edit videos, they love to, you know, create artwork. And, you know, they, there wasn't really an outlet for these folks to, you know, to put their, those talents to work in the youth apostolate. We had a, we had a, a choir, a praise ministry. We had an intercessory ministry, which would, you know, they would pray and all that. Um, and so we thought, you know, what is, what can we, what kind of work can we create so that people who have these talents can feel like they can use them for the, for the apostolate. And so we created what we called um, the, the creatives ministry. And the creatives ministry, we said, look, like we're going to set this up. Basically, it's for anyone who thinks of themselves as a creative, and you can either help us market the programs, um, create videos that that um, kind of give an overview of our of our workshops and our retreats, um, and that that ministry up to today continues to exist, and they are and they're so involved, and and this and this one small group that we initially pulled together becomes like a really important part of the of the apostolate. Um, which leads me to the second lesson, right? The second lesson is if you are struggling with seeing, or with getting commitment from people in your organization, in your clubs, people aren't putting in the time. Well, the, the one leadership lesson that is good for you to learn is that involvement creates commitment. Involvement creates commitment. Think of ways that you can involve them in the planning. Think of ways where you can tap into their superpowers um, and then give them the space to do, to do that work. 
And by doing that, you will, you will be surprised that people will be a lot more interested um, in putting in the time and effort because it becomes a chance for them, you know, to use their to use their skills that they enjoy using um, for the for the good of the of the organization. Now, this 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 requires a bit of creative thinking from you. You need to spend the time understanding what people want to do and are good at, and try to spot them, um, and then finding ways that you can craft the work so that people can. Um, can can go about um, contributing to your club. There's a really interesting study that comes out of um, Harvard um, that they have start, that they have called the IKEA effect. Um, so this idea of the IKEA effect. So you you might know IKEA. I think IKEA opened in the Philippines a few years ago. So IKEA is this place where you can buy furniture that you have to assemble yourself. So in this study, what they do is there are two groups. In one group, they they present the IKEA um, shelf fully assembled. And then they ask that first group, um, how much money would you pay for this shelf? And then they go to a second group and they say, okay, before anything, can you please assemble the shelf? And then after they assemble the shelf, they ask them, well, how much are you willing to pay for this shelf? And if you were to ask the question, and so the researchers ask the question, how much more do you think people will be willing to pay for a shelf that they have to build themselves? Well, what they found in this study, and they've replicated this multiple times, what they found that the group that had to build the shelf themselves were willing to pay a lot more money for that shelf than if they did not build it themselves. And this is exactly the same shelf. And by the way, like in, you know, in most places, you would pay less because you have to put in the work yourself to build the shelf, right? You would pay more money for someone to build it for you. But what the researchers found was that when, when people put in, actually the way they summarize the IKEA effect is that labor leads to love, which is the more you, the more effort you put into something, the more likely you are to fall in love with it and be more committed. So, so that's the second lesson. Involvement creates commitment. Um, a third story. Um, the third story um, comes back to this youth apostolate. And at some point in building this group, you know, we were getting more and more members really involved. And this was really my, my motto, you know, involvement creates commitment. How do I get more and more people involved so they get more committed? Um, and then how do I teach them to think about the superpowers of their teams to then also get them to, you know, to contribute to the work? Well, at some point, um, we were part of a larger community where there were adults and what we called singles who were really kind of post, post college. Um, and we were like the young group, the youth apostolate. And, you know, we wanted to do, you know, I had this vision along with my other co-leaders that we wanted to do something really big for the, for the group. And so we, we thought that we wanted to introduce what we then called the youth, the youth encounter, which would have been um, a, a retreat. I think it was like a three-day retreat that we would do it out of town. Prior to that, it, we would rely on the adults to run kind of the boring retreats that the adults thought, you know, would keep us engaged. So no, we thought, look, we have our own, you know, we have our own interests and we want to create something that's unique to kind of the spirit of, of the youth apostolate. So we thought, okay, let's start creating this um, this youth youth encounter. We called it YE. And then, as a way to get it started, we searched for a, a group in I think the Visayas. I think I can't remember now where specifically, but they we asked them to to do the first YE. We called it YE zero. It was a way to kind of test the idea. So we brought them in, and I remember in that retreat. Um, it was so bad. It was so bad. Like I remember that there were maybe two or three priests, uh, and there was a another layperson, and they were, they were, they, they had a difficult time making sure we were obedient and paying attention, um, and it was the the content was dry, um, and we it just didn't feel like a good fit. And so the year, the, the following year, we thought, okay, look, we started with this big idea. Um, how do we like make this feel like how how do we kind of achieve our vision to make this feel like really engaging for 
you know, for the youth that we wanted to bring into our to, to the youth apostolate. So then we had this crazy idea of like, well, what if we just designed it ourselves and that we designed it ourselves, we would consult, you know, our, you know, our elders, we call them, or our advisors, consult them, but really build it ourselves so that we could build it for what we thought our community really needed. And that felt really scary because it felt like we were going into uncharted territory. We were trying to do things that were not, um, that were, you know, that could really fail even worse. Um, and that's where, and, and kind of to cut the long story short, it, after after running that first version, it went so incredibly well that at some point when we were building the, the workshop or we were repeating this, this retreat year after year, at some point we had about 200 students in one retreat house. A hundred of them were there to attend the retreat. Uh, another hundred of them were there to 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 serve and to participate in it. Um, and again, in this whole idea of involvement creates commitment, like giving everyone a role that they will fall in love with so they can own and feel like they can um, really do this work themselves. Um, and I, I think up to today, you know, I'm still in touch with some of the leaders in that community. And that retreat has basically run for the past, I think, 20 or 23 years, um, really for the most part in the same way that we ran it. Uh, 23 years ago, um, and it taught me it taught me a lesson, and this is the third lesson. The third lesson is to do hard things. Is to not shy away from doing difficult things. Um, have big dreams, and if, by the way, when you look at the goals you set for yourselves, and you don't feel anxiety, and you don't feel nervous, and you don't feel um, some amount of imposter syndrome where it looked like, who are we to even venture into doing, uh, you know, reaching these goals? If you don't feel that anxiety and self-doubt, that means your goals are not big enough. And so I would say, think about what are those goals that you can, what are the convictions to the first story? What are, what are your convictions and who do you want to serve? What are the problems you want to solve? And what are the big ideas and the big goals you want to set yourself up for? And by the way, the way big goals work, I'll tell you, the way big goals work is that they don't always, you don't always achieve them, but it's so much better to, um, it's so much better to shoot for big ideas and fall short of them than to shoot for small ideas and achieve them. Um, I'm going to actually grab right here, you know, one of the, one of the things that I have here in a, in a, um, framed up here by my desk is a is a quote that I I kind of live by. It's a it's a long quote, so I'll I'll read it um, by Theodore Roosevelt. So he was one of the the great you know presidents of the United States. He said the following. He said, "It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit." belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows at the in the end of the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his play shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know nor, no victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt. So I have this at my desk, and this is kind of my guiding, um, uh, my guiding principle, if you will. So number one, what are your convictions? Number two, Involvement creates commitment. And number three, do hard things. All right, we can pause here and I'd love to hear your questions, um, talk about what's on your mind, um, and we can go wherever you want to take this conversation. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez. That was very wonderful and very, very insightful for me. Like, I, like, I truly relate to to what you were telling us here with uh, having that struggle of getting 
people's commitment and getting people to actually contribute and do the work in in your uh, in whatever organization you are leading. I think this. I personally, I think it worked for me. <laughs> I I think that applied where they gave me things that I love doing. They gave me opportunities that uh, I personally wanted to do, and it made me fall in love w- more with my role. And it wanted me to stay and run again in student council. What about you, Leon? What did That's you? Great. What are your points here? Um. Well, I felt a lot of the talk, but for me. I I want to highlight the fact that you said you have to take on hard projects to make them worthwhile. It feels like everything that I do, and it's a, this feels like a universal experience for everyone, really. Everything that I do, every project that I take on is like, it's mine to lose. You know what I mean? It's If it's not daunting, what are you doing even? And mm-hmm. I also like the what you said about everyone having their own superpowers. This is, it's very hard to execute properly, you know, when you have all these different people with uh, with all their different people problems. But when a project is working well on its own and everyone is using their own unique talents together, it's like the sum of everyone's talent is so much bigger than yeah. just each of its individual parts, you know? And of course, guys, um, the, the floor is very much open for questions. Um, and we, we highly encourage you guys to ask questions because yes. that was a really insightful talk for me. And I hope you guys uh, also felt um, as stimulated as I did. So, Kobe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You may type any questions and we'll do our best to address, you know, as many questions as we can. So, let's, I, I think we have a lot of questions already here, Leon. So, yeah. Uh, I'll read the first one that I see, which is from Nicolas Sandejas. Sir, what if yeah. I am stressed over the little things that I'm going yes. through? Yes. Okay. So, so Nicholas, what what you are pointing to is actually what psychologists call conscientiousness, and that is actually a really good thing. Um, the fact that you stress over the little things, you are the person I will go to to make sure something gets done. Uh, because I know you will stress over the little things. But here's a here's a hack. Here's a thing that I do to make sure I don't lose sight of the bigger picture as I get into the details. Because I'm I'm quite similar in the sense of I I'm very meticulous. I'm a craftsperson. Like I want the output that I you know as an author, you have to make sure that your sentences make sense. Um, you know when I when I work in a place like Google, you know excellence is a very there's a very high bar for excellence. So here's how I I do it. I think about the next month, or you might say the next three months, and I and I ask myself, what are the three things I want to achieve? The three big things I want to achieve in these next what four weeks, twelve weeks. Start there, and then you and then you ask. So you have that as your in your like t- you take a notebook, you take a journal, or you can even take a wall with post its and say, okay, here are the three big goals. Um, and then you take the next step and say, okay, well, to achieve those goals, what what needs to happen? And then maybe for each of those goals, there are another like five or six things. Um, and then you, or maybe 15 things, depending on how conscientious you are. Um, and then you ask the question, okay, if I were to just categorize this in terms of um, very important, you know, important and not important, how would I categorize this? And by do and by doing that, and so I, I wish I could show you a, a to-do list. I actually I actually tend to write my lists in Google Keep, which is a shameless plug for our product, but it's a really good simple um, checklist app. Um, I would then I would just then just order that. I would, before I get started on any job on any task, I will start the day with okay, what are the most important things, and then do the hardest things first. Um, why? Because by doing the hardest things first at, at the start of your day, um, a few things happen. One is you, you know, if they're the hardest and they're important, um, it might take more time than you anticipated, and at least you don't run out of time that day. But secondly, it also gives you that boost of energy because when you when you cross on this is why I like actually writing physical checklists. When you cross out an item in your to do list, 
Ah, the joy of that, just the the feeling of productivity. So that's how I would think about when you get overly stressed about the small things. All right. Thank you so much for that, Sir Martin. Now, guys, before we move on and read more uh, questions here, please do feel free to raise your hand if you would like to, you know, personally ask your questions to, to Sir Martin here. You are very, very much welcome to do so. So I'll Leon, read out this read next our... one, Kobe. So um, I, I like that, you know, the satisfaction. <laughs> but uh, I have one from Miriam Angel Preaguido. Good morning, sir. I have a question. What are some tips to understand others more, especially with people yeah. you barely know? So I'm going to tell you a very disappointingly like simple answer, which is spend time with them. Um you know, take them out. I don't know. What do kids do these days? Take them out for coffee, maybe not coffee. Take them out for, I don't know, a juice pack or something. <laughs> um, spend the time. Spend downtime. Um, ask them what they're interested in. Um, ask them the other clubs they've been at. Um, ask them if, you know, what, you know, what they want to do for college. And by asking, by being, like being sincerely curious about, about, you know, the people in your club and just, try to be like sincerely interested in them, you will find clues as to where you think you can, you know, involve them more and, you know, get them, you know, get them interested. Um, you know, this is something, I mean, Man Rentoy is a master in this. Um, the way you involve people is you start small. So you ask them, look, um, could you, like, could you design just the the flyer for this? Or like, don't go to them and ask them, can you lead this committee? Like, just start small, give them time. Or um, can you, you know, can you host this event just one time? Um, and let's see, and and then have them do it. And if they get that boost of like, wow, I contributed, I feel really good about myself, I feel good about, you know, this this organization, then you make the bigger ask and say, hey, what do you think about, you know, doing this two more times? Um, but but you But to uncover that, you have to spend the time. There's no two ways about it. Yes, thank you. I honestly agree. The same thing was uh, applied for us, our student council. We made it a point to try to have these hangouts once a month. At, we tried, well, emphasis on the try. But we did our best to hang out, go to the mall, maybe do some activities together outside of our, of our work. And I think it really helped us uh, to become more friends. I, I think this came from Sir and Toy as well. When he first, when I first met him, he told us that in our in our group, in our organization, we should become best of friends. All right, let's check some more questions here. I believe some were personally sent, but they, but there was one who requested that it that they remain anonymous. So I will read out this next question. Given okay. how committed my team is to reach our goals, but with no common time. How do you get everyone's schedules aligned and get them motivated? So when people tell you, I don't have time, that is usually code for, I don't think it's important. So when you believe it's important and when you feel committed to the work, you will make time. Um, part of how I discovered my career path in doing leadership and org development um, for leaders at Google and beyond was I discovered that when I would be asked to run a seminar, I would be so willing to stay up until 4 a.m. Look, it's not healthy to be up until 4 a.m., but when you're young, you can do it and still function the next day. But I'd be up till 4 a.m. to do to get it done. And I knew that was a signal for me that I actually cared so deeply about this work. Um, and so for me, when there is no time, that means that people don't care. Um, Kobe, I realized actually someone also sent me a direct message. So if I can read out the question, because I think it's a really Go good ahead. one. Um, I won't say their name, assuming that they probably want to be anonymous. They said, um, I often have big dreams, though sometimes I'm told my ambitions are too big. What do I do? I have two thoughts here. So one is, one of the one of the gifts um, Mr. Rehensha, who I know is in this call, gave me when I was in high school he was my mentor. My, we called them tutors back then. He was my mentor for a few years. One of the gifts he taught me was he said, look, pick up a, pick up a 
we called them filofaxes back then. I'm super dating myself, but it would basically be a physical notebook with a calendar. And use this, I guess, pair of schools use diaries, I think. So it was not quite the pair of diary, but it was my own personal um, uh, kind of calendar. And he said, just break down your big goals into the sub goals. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, and just be just be organized about it. So if let's say your big goal is a one year goal, what is the 12 segments of that goal where you can say, okay, for July, this is the goal that I need to achieve to get me closer to that. And for August, what do I need to do to get there? And just be very methodical and, and then revisit that list every week at the start of the week. I block off my Monday mornings. I know this is different when you're in school, but I block off my Monday mornings. I don't allow anyone to, to set meetings on my calendar. And I use that time to really think about what are my goals for the month and the week and how do I prioritize my work this week? Uh, and this was a gift that Mr. Rancher gave me when I was in high school, and that has carried me through college and my professional life. And I think that's really a, a, an important way to to plan. The other thing I want to say is the person who actually asked this um, is, um, you know, and I, I want to be very careful as I say this. So, so she's a woman, and I think it's so important to acknowledge that there sometimes might be some gendered kind of reactions that people will have when, you know, certain people who look a certain way will, you know, will cast large visions. Um, what we know from the data, and I'm not just saying this because I am some liberal woke kind of person from Silicon Valley, but, you know, there's a lot of data around this where, um, you know, we all face some amount of insecurity about our ability to, to achieve our goals. Um, some people call this imposter syndrome. Um, where you feel like, wow, you know, who am I to actually, you know, go for these goals? Um, at some point, people will realize I am just a fake. What we know from the data is that actually there are certain subgroup when you are in an when you are in a you know a subgroup, uh, an underrepresented group, in some ways in the corporate world. If you are a woman in leadership, that's a that's a more that's a minority group. Um, or you know, when I was growing up in Southridge, we had. A guy who was, uh, he was an import from the U.S. He was a white guy. He was the only white guy that we could see in all of our school. And so we kind of bullied him, which in hindsight was terrible. But um, people who are in the outer circles of society and of, you know, your, your community, they will feel a lot more self-doubt. Um, so to this person who asked the question, if they tell you your ambitions are too big, well, you can tell them, thank you. I'm going to go at it anyway. I was going to curse, but don't, yeah, we should not curse here. <laughs> that's, a, that's not a good answer. Uh, I think that's a great message. I, we do all come from different sociological backgrounds. We've all been raised differently. We all have different things behind us. But if we're not dreaming big, why are we dreaming at all, right? So I have another question, sir. What is your advice for someone that thinks they bit off more than they could chew in terms of organizational responsibilities? Okay. Um, so you need, you need, you need to bring other people along. So you need to, and this is where I get excited when I, when I hear this question, because this is exactly the kind of work that managers and leaders in big companies like Google and NJ, wherever, kind of everywhere I've been, this is the kind of work you need to, to learn how to do, which is think about all that you need to do and think about what is my highest and best use. By that, I mean, what is the what are the things in my list that I am uniquely positioned to do? And if I do this, the outcome will be the best outcome possible. If the answer is, I know this other person who would actually be so much better at doing this, or, you know, I am, you know, I can do this decently, but, you know, I have bigger things that I need to, to, to accomplish. Um, then think about how you can bring other people into the into the mix. Now, I'm assuming this is about the club. If this is about your education, like do the work, do the hard work and prioritize that. But if this is about, you know, the org, the org and the club, think about how you're going to bring other people along. And so think about how do I package a project um, in a way that feels like they can own it, they can get excited about this project. And it does take a bit of time. So to give you an example, I just hired an intern um, who is fresh out of college. Um, she's here in the Bay Area. She's Filipino. 
um, and she was wanting to do part-time work. And I immediately thought, okay, let me just call her and say, can I hire you? And, uh, the, and I realized, okay, I need, to, I need to actually sit myself down and write out what are the tasks that I think I need help with. And then how do I make sure that when I look at those tasks and I've, and I've put my shoe, myself in their shoes, like, will they actually want to do this work? And if the answer is yes, then, then you're ready to, to delegate the work. Yes, I, I, I actually agree. And I hope, I hope you guys are also really taking down notes. I hope you guys are taking down notes because everything that Sir Martin's been saying has been very insightful, especially for, for us and for me personally. So we actually have some similar questions. So we kind of packaged it into one. So uh, the next question is, how do we help others to find their purpose? How can we lead others to find their spark of motivation and to cooperate in social communities that require teamwork if there's the chance that motivation might never come? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I might, I might even transform the question to how do you find your own purpose and, you know, and, and sense of mission, right? There's a really good book called Range. It was written by a, um, by a journalist who kind of dove deep into the social science of, um, um, of this idea of, so he starts the book by saying, there's this, there's this story of Tiger Woods where he basically receives uh, the, um, he receives golf clubs from his dad at age three. And by age six, he's swinging his way to championships. And basically the rest is history where he, as a young prodigy in, in, in golf becomes like the world's you know, best um, golf player. And then there's a story of, of Roger Federer, who's a, who's a tennis player. Well, his story was he did not receive a tennis racket when he was three years old. He tried many different sports and failed in many of them. And only in his late teens, like in his 18, 19 year old, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, the story, um, they, um, he discovered that tennis was actually um, something that he enjoyed and that he would be good at. And as you know, Roger Federer is, you know, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Tiger Wood is one of the greatest um, golfers of all time. Now, his question was, who do you think, whose story do you think is more common? Tiger Woods' story or Roger Federer's story? Tiger Woods' story is this single-minded, you discover it easily, quickly, and then it, be, it shapes the rest of your life. The Roger Federer model is you dabble in a few things and then you discover what you end up deciding is your purpose. Well, they find in, the, in this book, they talk about how Roger Federer's story is the most common story. In fact, the Tiger Woods story is so rare that it's probably not even true for, for Tiger Woods. It's probably a fictionalized at this point, which is to say that they, they talk about how you need to have a, I think what, what, what economists have called a sampling period, which is you just have to try many different missions and many different projects and ideas. If you don't care to you know, spend your time supporting people who are less fortunate, Maybe your passion is in, you know, making sure the environment and, and climate change is averted. Maybe it's in, you know, supporting, um, you know, animal rights. Wh whatever it is, like, there is there are so many problems in the world that need to be solved. Um, you can pick any one of them and you can make a dent in that and that's worth a lifetime of, of effort. So if you're finding your own purpose, if you're helping other people find their purpose, um, you won't find it by convincing them of, of anything other than like giving them a chance to try different things out. Um, and then, and then it, they will discover it themselves. It's really not your job to help other people discover their, their passion. They will have to discover it themselves. That's, that's right, sir. Like I know a lot of you guys can relate to this, you know, your parents enrolled you in like 200 different uh, summer programs when you were younger, trying to get you into one thing. For me, you know, I was like enrolled in so many different, like I was like enrolled in like swimming, tennis, whatever. Um, and it's really, it's really different for everyone, right? So I have another question for you, sir. These are, you know, last two questions now before we cap it off. While I myself don't lead too often, 
What if my team's specialties or superpowers are not appropriate or can't really be utilized in a project due to external factors or expectations, and as a result, they become unmotivated? Yeah. Great, great question. So, so first of all, I would challenge that assumption. So try to see if you can actually craft a project. Maybe it's not exactly the project they want, but maybe there's a project that um, is comes close to to things that they're excited about. So that's the first thing I would say. Try to try to test your assumptions. Don't take no for an answer. And and I don't know if if any of my stories like the the red thread across all my stories is. Ask what you're convicted about and just make it happen. Like if people put obstacles in front of you and say it can't be done, challenge it. And so that's the first one. So the second one is, okay, so let's say that it's truly impossible. Let's say, I don't know, you want to do something completely heretical or complete like or something criminal. So don't do that if, if that's your conviction. Um, you might want to spend the time to understand, like, how do I position the work I need people to do? in a way that meets their goals. Um, you might try to understand, oh, so, so you, you want to organize this large sporting event. Um, we don't have budget to do that, uh, but we have this other, I don't know, like social event. Maybe there's something, maybe you can sit down with that person and say, look, like, I, like try to understand what, why they wanted the, you know, this event. Do you want to do it because, well, it's your chance to meet other people. Maybe it's a chance to raise funds and build a build a network with, you know, with companies. Maybe it's a chance for you to uh, look good in front of the girls. I don't know, whatever, or the boys, whatever that is, right? Um, and then see, could you maybe, could you, could you shape the work that you need help with um, that makes it feel like you can meet their goals um, by getting to this, um, to, to this work? Um, you know, something I, I teach founders a lot is to think about three sources of motivation, which is the head, heart, and the wallet. Uh, so many people who come into building a company, they'll either be motivated by the head, which is, you know, I care about this really difficult problem and I want to solve it because intellectually it's interesting. The heart is I care about this user group or this set of individuals who will benefit from the work and I want to, you know, I want to improve their lives or I want to make things better for them. The wallet, yes, for business is about money, but it's also about like a social wallet, which is um, by doing this work, can I associate with people? Can I build friendships? Can I have a fancy title like president of, you know, this um, of the student council? Um, you know, and, and and then try to understand, okay, so of the people that are demotivated in your group, is it head, heart, or wallet, social wallet? Because I'm guessing you're not giving away money, right? Um, and then try to think, okay, if it's actually, if it's about the heart, like they care about the mission and, and contributing to other people or, or the environment or to animal rights, whatever, like, can you position the work so that it really speaks to that, to the heart or to the wallet or to the head? So I'd say, think about it in those, in those respects. Wow. <laughs> I'm just like out of words. So thank you so much, Sir Martin. We just have one final question before we we cap off today so yeah what advice would you give on balancing your responsibilities as a leader effectively while you know still being able to succeed academically and not uh taking time from our personal lives to be able to socialize and spend time with our family yeah so can i say something controversial sure go ahead um yeah, I, I, your teachers are, are are now nervous about what I'm about to say. Um, uh, who was this author? Um, I believe it was. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I'll I'll remember. But an, a famous, a very prolific author once said, "Don't let your schooling get in the way of your education." which is to say when i look back at my time in high school and college the the most enriching part of my experience was in leading these student clubs i learned so much more that that built me up for success in the future by focusing on you know leading these groups um and i do not regret you know having you know i didn't have terrible grades and please don't flunk out because of your club involvement but 
I went from being an A student to being a B student because I got really involved in clubs and I don't regret it at all. I think that for me was the right mix. It built me up as a, as a, you know, as an individual so much better than if I was just purely in the books. I did not graduate top of my class. Um, but when I look across the people who did graduate top of my class, like their lives are start, you know, are so different from kind of the life I've had the, you know, the benefit and the, you know, the for the fortune of living. And so I would say, just think deeply about, you know, you are, you are the CEO of your own life, right? Think about what do you want? What do you want to learn from the precious time you have in school? You probably have two, two, one, two, three more years in high school, four years in college, perhaps if you go to college, that is not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things. So think about how you want to spend that time and how you would, the other thing I would say about friends and family, find ways through the work of your clubs to find a sense of community and build friendships through that. Um, when I was younger, um, I had this mantra of um, you can rest when you're dead. Um, this is not the healthiest idea, but people who maybe are able to, you know, if you have the resilience to work hard, um, work hard, um, put in the hours, like you all need to put in the hours to then, you know, you could either, you could either find work-life balance today and, you know, coast and feel, you know, good about, you know, yourself and, and all that. And then you will cap your growth early in your life, or you can push yourself really hard um, and, you know, and, and turn your trajectory at a different angle and you will just soar in a different orbit than people who choose work-life balance. Now, there are limits to this. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to get to a point where you are, you know, where you, you know, where you suffer too significantly. And you'll know that about yourself, but think about what you're capable of and then try to push the limit just a little bit. And you'll, you'll probably disc be surprised that you're, that you're able to do more than you initially thought you could do. Wow. Thank you so, so much, Sir Martin. And with that, we are, I apologize to everyone who sent their questions. We are so sorry if we weren't able to see and address your questions with the overwhelming amount of questions. Um, so the one thing I maybe I want to say before you go, because I know there were a lot of really good questions. Please reach out. And thank you, by the way, Mr. Salaman. I think I see you here. Mark Twain. That's right. That's the author. Um, Reach out. I you can find me on on Facebook or LinkedIn. I don't know if do students go on LinkedIn. Maybe not. Uh, but if you have questions that are bugging you, please reach out. I will find time to respond. Um, and if we want to do this again, I'm also happy to. All right. Uh, go ahead, Leon. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we are very thankful for each and every one of you guys for registering and attending today's event. Uh, you guys can claim your certificates as our thanks through the link posted in our chat box by Sir Manren Toy. That's right. We would also like to give a special shout out to our fellow Paris Student Councils for helping us promote this event and as well to Sir Luden Sal Salamat of Paris Southridge, Sir Ruch Rehensha now of Paris Northfield, and to Mrs. Lee Tobias of Paris for joining us here today. Now, before we say our goodbyes, we would like to have a group photo with everyone here. Hey guys, can everyone please turn on their cameras for our group picture? Just, you know, just for the books. 